Hello, hello. Good afternoon. Welcome to Afternoon Cocktail. This is episode eight, Strength. And today I've brought some really extraordinary guests again. I have Devin Powell, who is an MMA superstar. And I also have Miss Grace Stumberg from Buffalo, New York. How are you guys doing? Doing well. How are you doing? Awesome. Thanks for being on the show. So, Grace, are you ready to bless us with one of your original songs? Totally. <laughs> awesome. I love it. So, Grace is going to perform for you um, her song, single, Bittersweet, and it's from her album, Grace, and you could find that on gracestumberg.com. Grace, take it away. Silly playing cross the Atlantic. My American feet slapped onto your ground. No, I don't know what words you speak. I don't care, it's plain to see your eyes look right into my soul. How bittersweet this life can be. To the city, red wine and laps into the night. You brush my hair from my face, plant a flower upon my lips, and there the love began. This life can be. So you just heard the beautiful sounds of Miss Grace Stumberg. Thank you so much, Grace, for sharing your original songs with us today. Um, so you and I have a little history that goes back far. Um, we met we met probably like six years ago, possibly even more, out in Hamburg, just doing shows through a, a mutual friend. And um, since I've just seen you you blossom, you've done some really incredible things in like the past six years. Um, so before we get into that, I want you to, could you just tell us a little bit about your background? So you're from Buffalo, New York. It's where you currently reside and are performing out. Um, but also, I, I mean, does, do you come from a family of musicians or, I mean, what, what was it like growing up as Grace? Um, I, my parents were really big music lovers, both my mother and my father. Um, they had sort of different tastes in music, but I grew up in a house where my dad had like the latest stereo equipment and all of the CDs you could imagine back when CDs were a thing. And there was just like, you know, walls full of stacks. And I used to go through as a kid and just plug headphones in and just pick albums and, you know, listen to everything my dad was into blues my mom was really into like the rock and roll ladies like heart and um 
you know, yeah, heart's the best. Older sisters, which like, you know, one sister was all into hard rock and like, well, the 90s were a thing like Bush. <laughs> and then my other sister really liked just Mary J. Blige, Queen Latifah back when she was making music. So I really got like a taste of all kinds of flavors. Um, my sister can sing, but um, she only does it like secretly. Okay. But I definitely come from a family of just like lovers of music. I'm sure you made them all very proud. So you're the youngest of your two siblings? Yeah, I'm uh, 10 years younger and they're nine months apart. So I came a bit later. <laughs> oh, wow. Very cool. So uh, through your performances, you were handed an opportunity of a lifetime working with a uh, folk legend. You, you've spent quite some time working with folk legend Joan Baez. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how that all came about? That, you, that connection was made through one of your performances in Buffalo, correct? Yeah, I was, um, I was singing in my old alma mater, uh, Buffalo Academy for Visual and Performing Arts. I was a trumpet major. <laughs> and um, oh. I, I went back years later to, to give a concert and um, Apparently they'd already known about me prior, just that I was a young female that knew how to tune a guitar and change strings. And um, it was just sort of like the criteria that you, you needed because I was being hired to be a guitar tech and personal assistant, which entails like handling everything you could imagine. Um, so I got this email and I thought it was spam. It's like, hey, I'm here. <laughs> you know, Joan's tour manager and come on, you might have to look for earrings under a mattress and also make sure the guitars are in tune. And um, I never dreamed of leaving Buffalo. I, I never dreamed of traveling or the furthest I went at that point was Florida for a Bills game and we lost. <laughs> and, uh, oh, that's yeah. shocking. <laughs> I started guitar teching an, an assistant and then um, one day she found out I could sing and it was through a friend of hers that overheard me just messing around on a piano in a dressing room. She was like, hey, I heard you can sing. Do you want to sing with me during sound check today and just see if it works? Because, you know, voices are like colors and they go together and especially backup singing, they have to ma match. Sure. And so I did. And we sang Hard Times by Stephen Foster and she cried and said, it's like church. And then I was like going to cry because I was so nervous, you know, and then ever <laughs> since then we were just singing together and the rest was history really. <laughs> so you, you still assumed the role of being guitar tech and assistant and you were singing with her. Yeah. And it was crazy because she, she comes from that era where it's like, Hey, get on the mic. This is the song we're doing. We, we're not going to rehearse it, you know, good, like good luck up there. And so, yeah, I'd have to tune guitars, run them out, practice this song like 10 minutes before the show, after it was done, pack all her things. And I was like doing all three jobs for many of years. And then finally they were like, um, Grace, you look like you're a little stressed. We're going to, you don't have to guitar tech anymore. You know, you don't have to assist anymore. Just, just sing. And I was like, okay. I was like, but I could do it all, <laughs> you know? And then I just like, oh, wow, this is a lot, this is a lot easier. <laughs> so cool. Now, were you a big Joan Baez fan prior to this experience? I knew about her because my father had one of her albums. And when I was a kid, he told me I would have to learn this song, Diamonds and Rust. So I, and I sat listening through the whole album as a kid and it's just really odd to think that I wound up at her doorstep, so to speak. Well, hotel doorstep, but yeah. So I knew about her for a while. What was the moment like when you, you first were face to face? Like what was your first impression of Joan or what your, your job was gonna be like? I was terrified because I was in London, the first place we went. I didn't have the same accent as everyone. I felt like 
I was in the fashion capital and I was just like wearing a sweater and already I felt like, oh, this is, I'm scared. They're going to know I'm not from here. And then I have to go meet this folk legend and, you know, you see celebrities on TV and you hear they're very high maintenance and they're, they're not like other people, you know, so I had built all this in my head. And then I knocked on her door and they were like, Joan, this is Grace. Grace, this is Joan. And she just gave me a hug and she was like, well, aren't you young and fresh? She's like, come on <laughs> and welcome to the ether and see what you're getting yourself into. And she was very kind, like just automatically. I was like, okay, celebrities are people too. Right. <laughs> oh, funny. So it seems like she, she took to you um, pretty well. I mean, I saw pictures like just, um, you know, looking up more about you. There's pictures of her like hugging you and giving you a kiss on the head kind of thing. I, I think it was at her 75th birthday party. She even sang happy birth. She sang happy birthday to you before on stage. So yeah. she clearly um, adores you, which is that's got to feel so special, I imagine. Yeah. Um, did you ever believe that your relationship would evolve to that point? I didn't really, um, because it's just like, she's my boss. I have a job to do. Um, and I felt like for a while, I sort of had to, I don't know, be professional and just like be an employee, so to speak. But then over time, I was like, okay, that's ridiculous. Get that out of your head. Yes, do your job and be professional, but also, you know, connect and make a joke. And I'm very shy and quiet. And so I was for a long time. And then I was just like, you know, talk, laugh, go for walks, ask her if she wants to go to dinner, you know, do you, do you want to go out and see some live music? Just building a friendship. Um, and then opening myself up to that and, and Joan being so gracious too. Um, now that I'm not seeing her anymore, I feel like I've, I've like, moved away from a family member, you know, and it's tough. I miss her and I miss the rest of the tour oh. family. Sure. I bet. How long did you spend on the road with them? Eight years. I started when I was, uh, 23. <laughs> wow. Did you ever think that opportunity would lend itself to be that long? Um, no, because when I started, there were, talks that maybe she wanted to take a break and you know be done and it wasn't until all these years later that she finally decided that but I didn't know how long it would last um part of me today wishes it would last forever but the reality is is, is that it can't and I'm just really grateful that I was able to spend as much time with her and the rest of the tour family and travel around and like grow up you know <laughs> alongside of them. So one of the things we had we had talked about for a moment before the show began was, um, well, today's theme, as you know, is strength. And sometimes it, it takes being put into, sometimes it takes a little fear or being put into a situation that's a little uncomfortable for you, for your true strength to, to kind of come out. Um, you were saying that being on stage without a guitar, this was like really your first opportunity where you you were standing on stage just singing and how scary that felt. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Um, how that's changed your whole like performance experience and... Yeah, it it's definitely weird when you grow up playing and singing, like this thing becomes part of your body and it, you are behind it and you have something to hold on to and you're you're, you're kind of like, you just feel like you're not really alone. Um, but after having to leave it at home and just get in front of a microphone, stand in front of all of these people, it's like, they're looking at you, they're hearing you. And for me, that was really terrifying because I just, I felt so like not in my skin, but then I just had to put that fear aside and just be like, you know what? I'm here. We're making music for these people. People love it. That's what it's about. And, you know, as goofy as I may have felt without a guitar, I realized like 
it's a lot of fun. It is enjoyable, but it was just, I had to get out of my head, you know? <laughs> sure. That's a healthy challenge, you know, to, to face like in front of thousands of people, I'm sure. <laughs> um, but over time, I'm sure you, you grew more comfortable and, and now that's something that you could kind of add to your, not only add to your resume, but add to your life experiences. That's going to make you a better performer. Um, how has, speaking of this experience, how has your experience working for Joan and, um, you know, having folk music in your head for eight years straight, I mean, has that changed your sound or um, influenced your own songwriting in any way? I definitely think that she changed my mind as far as like how to reach people. Um, and sort of what you make music for. Um, I grew up like just wanting to play electric guitar and rip and scream in a microphone and, you know, get all that out, which sometimes I still do. It's very therapeutic, but I really love lyrics. And I love the idea that when you write lyrics, it should sort of inspire change and, and make people think. And she sort of opened my eyes to that. So I guess, yeah, she, she had a big influence on my sound after that. I preferred just a voice and a acoustic instrument for a long time, which I had never really thought about before. That's pretty cool. Has your experience touring with Joan opened up some international doors for you to perform and, and to showcase your music? I, I know I'd seen that you had performed in Ireland, right? That was yeah. part, while you were touring with her, you kind of did like a sideshow on your own, what was what was that like? It was good. Um, a lot of the people that actually came out were fans of hers too, so they would come and, and listen. And yeah, I've played in Ireland. I, I did a show in Paris, which was super fun because we, me and Grace Logan, who also became Joan's Guitar Tech, we set up a show uh, with our caterer from the venue. She was like this rock and roll <laughs> girl and she was like, I can get us a venue and I know this great place. So we played in front of all these Parisians who were amazing and loved the music. And, you know, now we're friends. We keep in touch on Facebook and um, we've played in Germany, just pretty much anywhere we were. We tried to book a show on our day off because it was really fun. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. What was like the, the language barrier? while you're performing so you're you're obviously performing in in english right i mean do you know any of these languages no i mean i can say hi please thank you um the basics but what i you know music really is an international language and the funny thing is as i realized over my years of traveling that over in europe and everywhere they listen to music in english you're hearing so and a lot of europeans can speak english um, yeah, that was really great. way better than we could speak. <laughs> yeah, and it just blew my Probably. mind. <laughs> it's so yeah, every, everyone in Europe can speak at least two, three languages, and I felt so embarrassed that I can only say you know hello, thank you, bye, and but it worked, and you know we just spoke the language of music, and every and everyone loved it, and it was fun to give that, and yeah, I hope to go back. Sure, and that, that's my next question. I mean, what what's your future plan? Do you um, plan to rehash those connections that you had built in touring and playing these shows abroad? Do you plan to go back and, and, and play there again? Are you recording a new album? Like, what's what's the next, what's up for Grace Stumberg next? Um, well, since she's retired in July, I've been home, which is weird. Um, I used to just leave my suitcase in the corner. That was my dresser. It still is in the corner because I'm itchy. And if, if I feel like I buy a dresser, that's going to mean like I'm here stuck. <laughs> but I, you know, I'm not, I actually had a show set up in June in Paris. Um, but with this whole madness, it's, it's canceled. Um, but I definitely want to go back because I miss traveling and I, I miss playing for, you know, in different places. And I definitely want to go back and book a small European tour and figure that out once, you know, once this is all over because the pandemic isn't really lending itself to booking at the moment. So 
I'm doing a lot of thinking and I guess planning. Good. Well, I mean, I, I wish you so much more con continued success. And um, I mean, yeah, I, I wish you the best. I mean, I, I think it's amazing. If there's, to me, there's no more beautiful combination than travel and music and people yeah. and sharing sharing that with people. I, I got a taste of that. I've never done it internationally, but um, I, I mean, take it as far as you can and, and run. You're so gifted. And uh, thanks for rep repping Western New York the way you do and doing great things. And um, I hope I see you in Rochester sometime. You should come out here and, and perform yeah. for us. I'll, I'll help make that connection for you once yeah. all this subsides and I'd things kind of go back to normal. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, Grace, you hang there because we're going to bring you back for one more original song in the end. And I'm going to bring Mr. Devin Powell to the center for an interview. Devin, you're there? I am here. Can you see me? I can see you. You got a pig? <laughs> a pig, yeah. I couldn't see in the little frame. That is awesome. What's the pig's name? Uh, Phoebe. Phoebe? <laughs> Phoebe, yeah. How much does Phoebe weigh? Uh, she's not that little anymore. Uh, she's probably almost 100 pounds. Oh, my God. That's this just like made my day um i've always wanted a pig i think pigs are so <laughs> so awesome but um so do you like bench press phoebe when you're when you're in pandemic mode and you can't get to the gym <laughs> uh, just you picking her up in general onto the couch is enough but yeah she, she <laughs> guns herself up. She, she's pretty agile and quick but i made sure she was up here for the interview it's my comfort blanket i love it yeah. Aw, that's awesome. Well, so you are coming to us right now from Maine. Um, thank you so much for tuning in and accepting this interview. I So you and I had made a Rochester connection years ago. Um, we were trying to figure it out. I think, I believe it was probably at a place called Victoire, which has since closed. But um, you and your wife came from a wedding, and your wife, Carolyn, has a Rochester connection, right? Her family's from here? Correct. Yeah, she's got a, a brother that still lives there, um, and uh, her grandmother is there in a nursing home, and then I think pretty much um, everyone else, aside from some, like, I think an uncle and um, some scattered family is still there, but yeah, we, we still go there, um, usually like twice a year or so, and see family. Um, it's, it's pretty great. We train when we go up there at uh, 10th Planet in New York um, with uh, Chris Herzog at um, at his gym. So, yeah. Very cool. So, I mean, what got you into MMA? Like you tell us a little bit about your background, like what fueled your passion? I, I had read that you were actually an aspiring guitar player for a moment in time. How did you go from that to becoming an MMA superstar? Yeah. I mean, I still, still pretty big on guitar. You can see like my half stack over there with my, my uh my F uh my, F my my fender strat and my uh my music man mariposa and i got a couple gibsons in the in the house too so music awesome. is part of my life um but the the thing that changed with me is that uh i stopped playing shows um and all my bandmates moved away um so after that uh i, I just wasn't as interested in playing by myself. It was just, I didn't have that same excitement. Um, and it was just too hard finding bands. So I started working um, at a passport center. I worked there for like seven and a half years. Um, but right off the bat, when I started working there, I was looking for a new outlet. Um, and performance was always like my way to express myself. So um, once music kind of fell through, I found mixed martial arts. I'd come home from the passport center every day. Um, super unhappy because I didn't like what I was doing and I'd watch WEC wreckage on TV um, and it just it excited me watching it and it kind of gave me that hope that if I tried it it'd give me that same feeling that um, that performing with a uh, with a band did when I played guitar on stage um, you know the, the idea of preparation and then um, you know executing the uh, you know ex executing the game plan in a way you know the, the way that you do and practice the same way you would whenever you're performing in front of an audience so 
um, I didn't know how far I would go. It ended up going really far. And it's my whole life now, thankfully. But yeah, that's how it all. How amazing. So, I mean, you're, you're a family man above everything. I mean, you have a beautiful young daughter. How old's your daughter? She's eight. Yeah. Eight years old. Now, now I'm a teacher. <laughs> And you're a teacher. Oh, well, that's right. You have your well, you have your own academy. Yeah, I teach um, martial arts for a living. I'm, I'm saying I'm, now I'm her teacher, basically, because of quarantine. She's out of school. For gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so grateful my my son's not. Um, he's only three and a half, but I I could see the challenges that poses um, for a lot of my close friends and stuff. It's it seems like it's been challenging for a lot of people. Um, so, I mean, what's it like being an MMA father, husband? I mean, do does your wife and your daughter, like when you first started um, getting into this venture and, and journey and through MMA, did were they ever concerned? Or even your, your parents, like, did anybody try to talk you out of doing this? Or is it hard for them to see you get hurt? I'm throwing a lot of questions at you, but I can't yeah. help but ask. Yeah, no, I mean everyone struggles watching, you know, the, the strongest people that I know are my brother and my father and they struggle watching, you know, um, like, uh, I've seen, you know, I've seen them have, uh, some serious, uh, <laughs> stress and, and anxiety, um, in the, you know, in the viewing of my fights. Um, my mom hides in the bathroom every time I fight. Um, she waits for tech <laughs> all over. She always goes to the arenas unless she has to fly because she she hasn't flown in over 20 years because of bad experience with turbulence but um other than than that every single place that she could drive to she's driven to to see me fight um but she's never actually seen it happen live she's just hidden in the bathroom um my daughter went into the cage with me after my first pro fight when she was only a year old um uh, my wife does this as well she manages the gym that we own no stos mma she uh, she's fought MMA multiple times, and now she's trying to prepare for a kickboxing fight. Uh, it got canceled because of the quarantine and uh, everything's getting shut down, including our gym. But um, it's going to get rescheduled. So yeah, we're. I mean, as as cliche of a term, we're definitely a fighting family. Clementine's done multiple um, tournaments in jiu-jitsu. That's my daughter's name. Um, she does jiu-jitsu and boxing and Muay Thai and all that stuff. Um, and she competes. She was planning on doing a, a Muay Thai, which is like a, a striking martial art, you know, the art of eight limbs, punches, kicks, knees, elbows. She was preparing to do a tournament recently and um, ended up falling through for her. But yeah, she's she's all in with this stuff as well. So, yeah. I saw that your wife was was fighting also. I think that's so cool. I mean, has that has her experiences fighting bonded you to? together even more so i mean you, you guys didn't start off as a fighting couple right you've obviously in, inspired her um, yeah how has that changed your relationship yeah i think um the only thing it's really changed is her understanding of the difficulties um that you you run into going through this um this lifestyle um you know everything else you know all of our bonds and the way we are together it, it's not anything to do with fighting we just we have a lot of similar interests in, uh, you know, music, movies, and, um, you know, uh, just personality. But just me doing it every day, she started doing it to get in shape. And um, it's just fun doing it, you know, doing Muay Thai and stuff. It's a good way to stay in shape. It's a lot more exciting than just going to, like, Planet Fitness and running on a treadmill, which is fine. But some people can't find the, uh, you know, they can't get motivated to do that. So she found this an easier way to do it. And since... I own the gym um, and she's there managing it. She just started kind of doing it. She got good and started competing. Um, but now she understands the stresses of weight cutting. Um, she's lost before, just like I have. And she understands how emotional it is and how it, it literally haunts you when you lose fights. You spend several months preparing for something. And then if it doesn't earn, you know, end out uh, the way that you're, you're planning for, um, it, it devastates you. So she understands that. She understands the difficulties of, um, trying to, to, to cut the weight, which, you know, losing 20 pounds in a couple weeks is, um, ridiculous. And it's something that we have to do and be disciplined for. And, um, you know, just, I think overall our health is a better in general, because if we're both chasing the same thing, it's, it's easier to do it, you know, 
um, it's easy to be a negative influence when you see somebody cutting weight, you know, it's, it's hard to see them suffer. So you kind of try and give them little cheats here and there, but if you're both kind of, um, you know, motivated and after the same kind of end goal, it's easy to stay on track. So, yeah. Does that pressure of cutting weight, um, negatively like impact you guys? Like, I know I get hangry. So I could not imagine, <laughs> I could not imagine, I could barely like try to lose three pounds at this point in my life. But like, I, does that ever feed into like, you guys are both like trying to, to cut weight or um, be at a certain point pre prepping for a performance that like you guys are just like have to stay away from each other because of irritability or nervousness? Does that interplay like in your role as husband and wife at all? Um, I don't think we've ever been in a camp at the same time at, at like the, the end of a camp, you know, like the, um, the beginning of the camp, it's all dieting. You're, you know, you're, you're being careful to your calories, all that stuff. Um, and you're slowly trickling down, but it's really the last week where you're, you're almost eating nothing. And then the last um, couple of days, you're cutting like 10 pounds of water out of your system. Those are the ones where like, you, we would need somebody else, like a, a third wheel to, to overlook us, to keep us, one, not going to the hospital by doing it incorrectly, um, and two, just making sure that we're not killing each other, um, and uh, yeah, keeping everything going smoothly. You need the other person to, to push you through the weight cut. Um, it's a lot of work, you know, you're, you're going in and out of the sauna, you're laying down, getting wrapped up in towels, um, you know, you're spitting into a cup you're you know you're not eating um you're making sure that when you get back up you're not fainting so somebody's kind of holding you up and making sure that you're you're cooled down and recovered enough to be moving around again um weight cutting is a scary thing so that's the hardest part of it for sure so we've never had to cut weight at the same time um and I don't, I don't know if we ever would but again if we did we have a big team we have a lot of fighters we'd have plenty of people that could help us do it i just i personally wouldn't want to do that i like having the other person completely healthy and um you know have their wits and, and senses to make sure the other person's safe what's the one thing coming out of um a fight that like is there anything that you're like okay now i did my fight i need a burger or i need a steak or like is there anything that afterwards or do you pretty much stay like in line with you know, you're dieting or, you know, I'm sure you have cheat days, right? Like what's the not, one thing you crave the most? Not, uh, not in fight camps. There's no cheat days. Um, just because yeah. it's one thing, if you're like, it's easy to maintain weight. If you're having cheat days, you're not, you know, you'll, you'll put in extra calories and you'll burn them off. But in a fight camp, like for example, I'll be like, I'm, I'm in like the, the one eighties right now. Um, and I fight at one fifty five. but if I were to, sign a, a fight contract i would try and get down to like 175 within like a week or so and then i stay at the 175 and slowly trickle down the next couple weeks um and then the last week when i'm going into fight camp i'm usually 169 pounds and then each day um of that last week of cutting weight i try and lose um like a pound and a half um and then the last day is when i start doing the the water like the night before so I water load. So my body's used to shedding more water. Um, so I water load and then I, I cut that last uh, like seven to eight pounds of water. Um, so you can't really do the cheat days during fight camp because it's just you're going to you're going to die trying to cut the weight at, at the end. But after the fights, you know, I, I definitely eat like terrible for a little bit. Um, I don't I don't really eat meat. I haven't since I was 14, but um I, if I'm craving something, ice cream is usually the thing I want. I don't know why. I just I like ice cream a lot. It's kind of my my go to. But um, yeah, who doesn't like ice cream? Ice cream's the best. Yeah, <laughs> that's the one that I like getting for sure. You know, after a fight, I'll, plus my jaw usually hurts from getting punched in the mouth. So something cold's usually pretty nice. I quit drinking like four months ago. After fights, I'd always go out and go wild. So gonna be interesting not being able to numb the pain like that after but um, I just had knee surgery from a recent injury in a fight um, for Bellator so I just figured with the quarantine and um, with recovering from knee surgery and all this stuff I mean well, it was actually way before the quarantine it just happened to be a, a good thing that I'm not stuck home drinking every day or something but 
Sure. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I, I, uh, well, I was going to say, I mean, speaking of injuries, so, I mean, you're no stranger to injuries. And one of the things that came up, which I didn't even know if it was appropriate to ask, but you had brought it up earlier. <laughs> So as I'm researching you and your career, um, one of the injuries that kept popping up that you seem to get a ton of press for um, was that you actually ruptured one of your testicles. Am I oh, accurately yeah. describing this? Or, I mean, could you tell us about... I'm, I'm assuming that was probably one of your most painful injuries ever. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, yeah, it was just training. I was... Uh... I was with my friend um, and teammate and coach, um, Joe Lozon, who trains in Massachusetts and runs a gym in Massachusetts. Um, he's one of the, the most famous UFC fighters um, out there. He's uh, one of the winningest um, like performance of the night um, bonus winners. Basically, like if you win by submission really well or like a good knockout or a good fight of the night, you get a $50,000 bonus. So he's he's one of the, um, the highest achieving in that department in the you know of, of all time so it was an honor that it happened with him I guess but it was not <laughs> fun by any means um we were just rolling jujitsu which is basically like submission grappling um we weren't doing any striking we we're just um doing it's kind of like wrestling around with each other um if you don't know what jujitsu is but um he was trying to get past my guard which a guard is a position that you can submit someone from when you pass a guard you can usually submit the other person so we're battling with each other. He's trying to pass my guard and he ended up kneeing me in the groin. Um, and I wasn't wearing a cup. So now I wear a cup basically 24 seven, you know, when I brush my teeth, when I go to bed, I always, <laughs> um, but yeah, if you want to like the, the grizzly details, he basically came down straight on it and sandwiched it between like, um, his knee sandwiched it between that and my like pelvic bone, I think. Um, and it just, popped it um so basically it's got like almost like the way i equated is like a baseball how it's got all that stitching so the baseball outer you know leather exploded out of the stitching and then all the content starts spilling to the outside so it kind of felt like it had like a unicorn horn on it uh, so i knew something was not right at all but i i tried to shake it off i uh, i went and showered up and then we drove the two and a half hours back home um I had a couple adult beverages to, to numb the pain as I would say help sometimes. Um, and then I waited like a day and a half. Um, and I put a bunch of posts, well, not a bunch, I put a post on like Facebook or something and a bunch of people responded when I asked like if anybody had had any serious injuries to that area before and everyone said I had to go to the doctor. So I did, um, they did an ultrasound and right after the ultrasound, they came out. Um, and they're just like, so what have you had to eat or drink today? And I knew because, plenty of times before that that's key for you're going in for surgery. Um, so yeah, I ended up getting rushed away. Um, took the ambulance, they called in the doctor, um, to do the emergency surgery. And then, yeah, before that I asked the ambulance, um, driver to, to take a picture with me and I posted about what happened and how I was going in for emergency surgery. Um, and it ended up going on TMZ and the Jim Rome show. I get to talk to him and Ariel Hawani who's the biggest MMA um, broad or like newscaster or interviewer um, out there and uh, yeah it was barstool sports all this stuff and then um, yeah I mean it was a blessing in disguise because the UFC was kind of at a standstill with me I was just waiting on my next fight and then uh, I just told Jim Rome that the only thing I wanted was the UFC to call me and give me a fight and then they did and then I had a fight in Calgary that I won with a liver kick in the first round so yeah it was an awful injury but you know I came back and uh, they they did the emergency surgery. They stitched it back up and put what they could back inside and cut out the rest. And uh, yeah, it's Frankenstein stitches in there for the rest of my life that are metal. Oh so. my goodness. I do not have testicles, but I, yeah. I imagine that was not a pleasant experience. Um, no. I mean, but I'm, I'm so grateful to hear that, that that's what helped, you know, bring you to success you know fighting for the ufc was that something you ever imagined you would do um i mean you fought four fights mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. yeah uh i mean it, it's not so a lot of people that fight they like kind of need to fight 
and that's like they're like oh i want i gotta fight in the ufc or bellator or, or now pfl like one of those big money leagues um which i mean by big money league it's not big money at all like you can make you know a, a normal job for most americans is probably going to pay you more than what you make um fighting for one of the biggest leagues in the world unless you fight enough times where you end up getting a decent contract um but it's still not like that much money there's very few people it's not like the NFL or NBA where everyone gets like a lot of money and then some people make an absurd amount of money. Um, but I always loved martial arts. Like I did it because of the passion that was in it. So um, I thought that I should express myself through fighting because I was good enough at it. And, uh, you know, I just got really good and uh, a lot of good opportunities arose. I get to fight for World Series of Fighting, which was NBC's fight league. Um, and then I get to fight for a title, um, which I won. Um, and then an opportunity came up to fight short notice on a, on a TV show, Dana White looking for a fight. It's like a YouTube TV show that, um, or a YouTube show, what you call it. but season two, episode one, you can see it. Um, I fought on that short notice um, and I won, I got signed to the UFC. It's a good fight. I, I broke my nose in that fight. It's like all the way over here in the fight. Um, and I also tore my LCL in that fight is like the side ligament in your knee um the outside ligament um so yeah i, I ended up just t running with it every time I, I had an opportunity i just ran with it um but I, I opened up my gym before all that um and i knew that's what i wanted to do for the rest of my life because fighting you have a, a timeline you only do it so long and i've already actually outlived it as as far as i thought it was going to be i thought i was going to stop by the time i was 30 um just because uh you know, it's been 10 years, um, but I train carefully as much as I, you know, I have plenty of other injuries that I can say, you know, like in Argentina, I went blind in one of my eyes, but um, I don't spar I hard. Saw that. Yeah, I, I don't Crazy. spar hard outside of the, um, outside of, you know, actual fights. I'll do a couple harder sparring sessions, but try to protect the brain and save the, the hard contact for um, actual fights. So I think I do everything right to have a long career, but um, yeah, I've already accomplished everything that I've, that I really, more than I, what I thought I was going to, you know, and I'm going to keep running with it. You know, my last fight went viral. I won and I, I took my opponent out and he started wrestling the referee and it got like 30 something million views. Um, I watched so, that. Yeah. That so, wild. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've had plenty of downs too, but the, the ups are, you know, it's like a drug, so it's hard to, to get away from it. You know, you're, you're definitely addicted to to, to the violence, you know, the controlled violence that, you know, you're, you're kind of creating art with your fists and your elbows and your feet. Um, and, you know, you're getting this crazy audience. So it's, you know, it gets you high. And then um, the lows are so low and the highs only last a little bit. And then it's on to the next thing. What can you do, you know, to, to keep yourself motivated and excited and happy? Um, you know, and without having fight camps, it's it's hard to do that sometimes. I've, I've gone 13 months without fights when I've trained six days a week, um, eating good, staying ready to take a short notice fight. And that's what ended up happening when I fought in Calgary. It's a 13 month layoff with that terrible in, uh, injury where I had to have surgery. And then, um, you know, and then I was right back in the game with 30 days notice and um, get the job done. So it's a tough lifestyle, but yeah, I, I, uh, I don't need a fight, which is a good thing. I have my gym and it's really successful. We're closed because of quarantine, which really is unfortunate, but um, the passion is there for me to keep doing it. And once it's not there, or once I feel like health is um, too much of a matter that I should stop and I'll just stop. Uh, you know, I, let's, let's talk a little bit more about Nostos. Is that, am I pronouncing that wrong? You could Nostos? be. I, I don't really know. I, I found the name it, and it goes back to the, uh, the passport center thing, how I hated what I was doing. Um, and the opportunity arose to open my own gym and I was looking for something that literally meant like, welcome home. It's like arriving at your final destination. So when the soldiers came home from the Trojan war, they called it the Nostos, which means arriving at your final destination. So, um, I thought it was cool. Fit. I was wondering where that, that name came from. Um, yes. I mean, so this is your fighting academy in Summersworth, New Hampshire, yep. and you live in Maine. So this is just over the border. You said like about a half hour from where you yep. live. Um, I mean, tell us about your program. What inspired you to begin it and what inspired you to begin your business journey? Yeah, well, I, uh, 
I trained at the same facility um, for for a couple of years before I actually uh, owned it. So it was called the Shop MMA, um, and I, I trained at Port City Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, which was Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Um, I do all my Jiu Jitsu there, and then I travel down there and I do uh, just MMA. So after a few years of that gym being in operation, one of my training partners, Bill Jones, uh, was in a position where he just couldn't run any classes and they were going to close down. So he gave me the opportunity to take over um, and to create my own gym there. So we shut down the gym for a couple weeks. We went in there, we remodeled, um, we created a new name or well, I created a new name. Um, and then we opened up and we, I mean, we really didn't have any students at that time because it was, you know, we shut down and it was the reason that they were, they were stopping operations just because no one had time. So classes kind of had fallen through. I just went there to train with a few people. Um, Bill was one of my main training partners. So, um, and he knew that I was probably the most um, fitting to, to try and create a real structured academy there. So we did that. We, um, we have three rooms that we run classes in. Um, we got all new mats and wall pads. We went down to the basement and removed probably like 20 years worth of garbage that was just sitting in the basement, all rusted out and gross. And, um, and then we poured cement in the basement. We matted the entire thing. We put strength and conditioning equipment down there. We put uh, like a 50 foot bag rack, a 50 foot um, AstroTurf strip for sprints and sled pushing um, and a sauna. So we did a lot of renovations over the last six years now. Um, and it's, yeah, it's a whole new facility. It's, it's pretty crazy if you look at the before and afters, but um, Bill Jones is the one that I, I kind of owe the opportunity to 100%. Um, I, for the first year I worked at the passport center still, um, I'd work 645 to 315. Then I would go to the gym. I would teach all night, um, Monday through Friday. I'd come home, get in bed by like probably 12 o'clock. Um, and then back to, to work at, um, six, 645 and then Saturday and Sunday, or sorry, Friday and Saturdays, I bounced at a bar. Um, and then Sundays I taught jujitsu at a preparatory school in Danvers, Massachusetts. And that all those jobs were to keep the doors open for that first year because we didn't have any students and I couldn't afford the bills at the gym without working those three other jobs. So for the last five years at the gym, I haven't had to work at any of those places, just the gym and fighting. So yeah, it was a crazy first year. So amazing. I mean, congratulations on all your success and I wish you so much more success from here forward. Um, what is Nostos's website? Uh, it's nostosmmagym.com, N-O-S-T-O-S-M-M-A-Gym.com. Awesome. It was really super cool to pick your brain, and thank you for giving me your time. Um, Miss Grace, are you are you ready to cl close us out? I mean, Devin just made me super hungry talking about his regiment, so I hear that's <laughs> – it seems – to deem appropriate for you to sing your song titled Hungry. Um, you want to take it away for us? Certainly. Thanks for having me today. <laughs> oh, thank you. And I just want to sing this for all the people that are searching for how to feed their soul during this crazy time. Just do things you love. <laughs> I've got a job. And it pays me something When I get home It turns into nothing I don't want to buy into their lie And I've got to work 24-7, 365 until I die Yeah, i got to get out This whole, this whole, this soul I've got is hungry. This whole, this whole, this soul I've got is hungry. Oh, and Darwin said. It's survival of the fittest. 
And I refuse to be just another statistic. Oh, I won't buy into that lie. That I've got to do whatever you tell me till I die. I got to get out. I got to get out. Cause this whole, this whole, this soul I've got is hungry. This whole, this whole, this soul I've got It's hungry It's hungry Miss Grace Stumberg, gracestumberg.com is her website. You could stream her music, I, I believe, from there. She's on all streaming services. Thank you to Devin Powell and to Grace Stumberg for being a part of this show today. And uh, before I leave you all off, I just wanted to say this is, we are one, uh, just about reaching one month into this pandemic. And it's been one month since I've musically worked my last gig. Um, my needs have never become more apparent. And it's been throughout this pandemic, which I've, I've had the time to self-reflect, self to do a lot of thinking and a lot of absorbing. My mother, father, and sister busted me all the time for not being able to sit still. And um, truth is, you know, being productive is what mentally keeps me sound. I choose to live every moment with purpose, and I believe that all the work I put into bettering myself translates to how I react, how I perform, and how I treat those around me. I'm a passionate being, I love to work, and social interactions are so detrimental to my mental health and well-being. And I realize that now more than ever. I mean, strip this all away, and I feel like I'm floating in space. At least that's how I felt for the first two days of this pandemic, truthfully. I was walloping in the wise and was feeding into the fear that all I'd worked years for was about to just disintegrate and disappear. I was allowing my negative thoughts to consume me. Anxiety and depression, I'm no stranger to, it's a part of my history. And fortunately now, although both visit time and again, I possess the ability to, to see it coming and work myself through it. And the only reason I have that capability is because my mental strength has been tested and trained throughout all my past experiences. We must work to develop the kind of mind that can cope under pressure, the kind of mind that can get in the game when we are behind or even stay in the game when we're losing our lead. Today's guest, Devin Powell, is a stellar example of just that. Long-term success in sports and frankly, in life itself, it relies on mental strength. Beyond the physicality of training, we've got to dig deep within ourselves to play that mental game well too. When we can overcome our impulse to give up, we develop skills for a lifetime. When we can bear the painful feelings that arise when we are struggling, we gain strength not only for that moment, but for all the moments that will inevitably challenge us in the future. The kinds of experiences that strengthen us are experiences that challenge us. Challenging experiences are not hard to come by. I mean, life is frustrating. Life could suck. And at times, it's very disappointing. Staying strong in the midst of hardship requi requires you to manage your thoughts, feelings, and behavior. The easy way out is to fill your thoughts with self-doubt and anxiety and to become victimized by those beliefs. Negative thinking will affect your behavior, which can inadvertently turn your catastrophic predictions into a self-fulfilling pr prophecy. Your mind could be your best friend or your worst enemy. Feeding into negative thoughts will limit you from reaching your greatest potential. So accept what's happening right now and consciously decide how you want to respond. Accepting reality is about re re ugh, sorry. Accepting reality is about recognizing what's within your control. Take control of your destiny. Stop the self-pity. Stop making excuses for why you're not doing the things you really want to do. Be proactive. Take a risk. 
Push yourself into unknown territory and begin taking steps forward, fulfilling your wants and needs. Not everything will work out just the way you imagine, and that's okay because the knowledge that you'll obtain throughout your experience and the mental strength gained throughout the process is far more beneficial to your success than never trying at all. Gain new skills, gain a new mindset, allow your journey to unfold before you. Remember, a mind is like a parachute. It doesn't work if it doesn't open. Cheers to all you. Happy Monday. A uh, big, big thank you always to Mr. Bo Yeah, Bo Yeah Productions, and to all of today's guests. Please take a moment to subscribe to us on YouTube, Afternoon Cocktail. Just look it up in the search engine. Um, we have our YouTube link we'll enclose as we post this, and you feel free to binge binge out on all past episodes. We've had some such amazing guests. I'm so grateful for not only today's guests, but for everybody who's made us, you know, here at episode eight. Be good to yourselves. Have an awesome day. And I'll see you Wednesday. Peace out.